Hello there, where have you been? We have been busy here on the Tomarosa, so we're a little bit sorry that it's been a little while since we had a video, but we're excited to talk to you today about considerations for starting a dairy farm. Some of the things we have been busy on is some planting. We'll have a video about that. I've also been working on getting my garden ready. And we put in this pretty snazzy split rail fence in front of the house and the barn. We're also working in the barn on getting some things ready before this next dairy season, which will start in May. Welcome back to the Tomarosa. It's springtime for reals and we've been super busy. Uh, but we thought we'd try and get a video out. So here we are. And today we are going to talk about something we get asked about all the time. Starting a dairy. And to help us along in explaining uh, how to start a dairy, uh, we have an awesome uh, extension publication that we're going to reference. So if you see us looking down, it's because we're referencing the uh, extension publication. But it goes through starting a dairy. And uh, so we're going to kind of go through that and talk about it in regards to our experiences so when we we cover things it's going to be more of a perspective of starting a producer handler dairy because that's what we are we process and distribute our own milk um, so this doesn't really apply to a commodity type dairy at least what we're going to be discussing all right let's dive right in number one all right so they have a nice list here for facts to consider before you start a dairy. Number one. Your capital investment will be high. Yes, I think of, uh, of all the different types of farming enterprises, I think dairying is pretty much one of the highest. It's up there. Uh, a lot of stainless steel, of course, you know, the equipment needed to produce sanitary, clean milk, keep it cold, process it. You know, all that equipment's expensive. Cows are expensive. And then other facilities, you know, cattle handling facilities uh, are expensive headlock stuff and your structures. Uh, our barn is a pole building, which is a relatively economical building to construct. But then we all throw in the extra stuff for daring, like all the concrete, lots of concrete, the smooth cleanable walls and ceilings, slope floors to drains, plumbing, electrical requirements. Uh, so I'm tired. It, it, it all adds up, yeah. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm tired. Now I'm just like reliving in my mind like everything that he just said, that all the steps we went through. And, and I skipped some, I'm sure. <laughs> so you could either buy a dairy and start that way, or you can do what we did, and we started from scratch. And the positives and negatives are, if you buy a dairy, you are going to have to pay up front for all of that. You might be inheriting somebody else's problems that you don't even know yet, that you're gonna have to spend time fixing. And but, money. And money. But the positives are, you can start farming right away. If you've got the basic facilities, you might just have to do a little bit of work and you can start farming and start making money. For us, because Stacy was still in the Coast Guard and we had 10 years to retire, because we bought the land in 2010 and he retired in 2020, we had time on our side. Some of the pros and cons to how we did it starting from scratch. I mean, this land was just bare land when we got it. We had to drill a well, put in driveways, put in fence, build a shop, build a house, build a barn, put in electricity. And like Virginia said, time was on our side. And that gave us an opportunity to leverage our own labor uh, against the cost. Because we built pretty much everything ourselves. We saved a lot on labor. But it was still a ton of work. It was we look back and like we went straight from building the house into building the barn to milking cows and it's like i wonder why we're tired <laughs> i have no desires to be a carpenter <laughs> but i guess what i would say is if you're in the situation you're like you know what i think i like to dairy and you're trying to figure out which way to go i guess it depends do you have time or do you have money or do you have both and that will kind of help you figure that out all right number two your income will be steady and dependable, but not spectacular. In general, I would agree with this. Uh, as a small producer handler dairy with just three cows this last season, we made money. And, you know, that's the subject for a different video, but we're very happy with the income we made. 
you know, outside of strictly monetary uh, considerations, I think we live a pretty rich life. So I'm happy with what our three cows have provided for us. And this year we'll have four, and next year we'll have five. And depending on how many heifer calves we'll get this year, we'll know how much we'll have in two years. So we're continuing to grow slowly, and we're able to have the dairy pay for itself. And that, I think, especially in the first year, is quite an accomplishment. We couldn't be happier. We thought we were going to dump a lot more milk. <laughs> we didn't hardly dump any. We sold out every week. We love it. All right, number three. Your labor requirements will be great and supply must be regular. So this is definitely true. You know, you have to take care of the dairy cows every day. If you are not doing seasonal dairying like we did, you will be milking cows every day of the year. And if you're doing twice a day milking, of course that's twice a day every day of the year. And even when they're not milking, you're still feeding them, making sure grazing, you know, getting them bread, all that is other things. So it's not as simple as just going to an office in a cubicle. You have a relationship with your animals. You have a relationship with your customers. And they depend on you. The customers depend on you and the cows depend on you. And you just have to be prepared for that. It's a big responsibility. And it's not just feeding cows and milking cows. I mean, you got to be looking at them, trying to figure out, you know, if there's something wrong. They can't tell you, you know, if something's wrong. You got to figure it out on your own. You got to figure out when to do breeding. It's a lot, but we like it. Number four, you must have enough cleared land to raise all your roughage. I wholeheartedly agree with this. Uh, we did have to buy a little, little bit of hay this winter, but I couldn't imagine having to buy all our hay. Uh, for the most part, we raised all our own hay, and we were very happy with that. And I think that's part of the key to our success is we were able to raise all of these forages on our own with our equipment all of our equipment's paid for it's pretty low-tech stuff but it works well but even as an alternative even if you have to have somebody custom harvest and bale your hay or whatever that's still better than just having to outright straight buy it i think number five you must have a market near the farm this is something definitely we took into account when we decided to buy our farmland we are six miles north of Chewila, Washington, which we thought would be a good market for us, and it has. Uh, we are close to the main road that runs from our farm to Chewila, and that's also an important consideration, especially if you think some people are going to be coming to pick up items off of your farm. We wanted to have a place that was easy to get to. Keeping in mind the market that you want to meet is also as important when you're trying to figure out which farm to buy. And number six. You should be experienced in handling dairy cattle. We have worked on so many different dairy farms. It has been so valuable, the different experiences that we've gotten uh, from all those different people. And uh, we owe a debt of gratitude to all our mentors, and we still rely on them. Uh, sometimes stuff happens, and we're like, we don't know what's going on. So chances are one of our mentors has seen it before. And uh, so we really appreciate having them in our lives and still depend on them. But uh, I couldn't imagine trying to start a small dairy without having the experience of working on other people's dairies first. And we love having our videos on YouTube. But you have to understand, all of our videos are edited. And they're more like to show you what we're doing. They're not full-on 100% instructables. And there's also um, information that you can't get unless you're there in person. So being on other people's farms, even if it's just for like a weekend or, you know, one or two days, having a chance to talk to them and see how they do things, you'll pick up things that you didn't even know. And then you'll pick up some things that you're like, I definitely don't want to do it this way. And that's another thing that you've learned. But, you know, you, you do need that hands-on experience. And you need to have those mentors that you can call, like Stacy said, when you're, you know, in the middle of trying to figure something out as well as having other people in your toolbox, like your vet and things like that. Of course, you gotta have a good veterinary relationship. You may be wondering, what is this amazing government publication and where can I find it? We will put a link in the description, but the title is Bulletin 19, September 1955. Getting a start in daring in Alaska. So, 
times change. This is 66 years old, but the facts to consider before you start a dairy, the six things we talked about, I think those are pretty timeless. If you do go and look up this publication, uh, just remember that times have changed. Uh, we don't agree with everything in here, but most of the overarching principles we agree with. And so take it with a grain of salt and do your homework. Now we're going to go through and give you a nice selection of some of our favorite quotes. A long, hard struggle can be expected if you homestead or buy an undeveloped farm, but it can be done. It can be done. We, uh, we took that route. And part of that is raising your own animals. And the last quote is of this paragraph where they're talking about starting from scratch is, raising heifers will also give you valuable experience which is very true if you've ever raised heifers and I think is a wonderful understated statement. Qualifications for dairying. You should have certain qualities to be successful in operating a dairy. These are farming experience, initiative, and ambition. So true. Which we talked about getting some experience yeah. and the initiative I think has to do with uh, doing a lot of your own work and your own repairs and being prepared. To do those things. A herd demands careful observation, planning, and attention to details. Daring is not automatic. A successful dairy should have a herd large enough to bring in an adequate income. You should not hire help for any dairy work if it is a one-man operation. A good dairyman will be able to handle 15 to a 20 cow herd. And then it goes on to say, after the dairy has been operating a number of years and the debts are cut to a low level, you might be justified in hiring someone to do your work, but only then. This is true of any business. <laughs> so Stacy mentioned as we were reading this that that 15 to 20 cow limit doesn't include if you were doing value added products. Yeah, processing your own milk is time consuming. It takes up a lot of our time. I think next to actual animal husbandry, I think marketing is probably our next major time consuming item. I agree with Stacy. Marketing is a big part of what we have to do to keep our business going. And we both worked really hard on that and we're very happy. We have great customers and they have really brought a lot to us in our farm. It does talk in here about what breed should be kept. Some factors to consider when selecting a breed are one, breeds most common in the community. Two, availability of good bowls of the breeds selected. Three, personal preference. And four, how the milk is sold and priced. So going back, breeds most common in the community. Uh, we have jerseys, uh, New Zealand jerseys, and we got those from a farm that we worked on, which was relatively local. Uh, we didn't have to bring them, you know, from several states away or anything like that. Availability of good bulls, other breeds selected, you know, with AI, I mean, the sky's really the limit with AI, so we were able to maintain the New Zealand genetics through that. Personal preference, we just love jerseys. Who doesn't? Who doesn't? <laughs> They're so cute. You got the big eyes. They're just beautiful cows. And then how milk is sold and priced. Uh, another reason we chose jerseys is because we are selling fluid milk and we wanted the the richness the the high butter fat and the high solids uh, that come with jerseys and their milk is also good if one wanted to make cheese and we find it really good for yogurt as well so the the jersey breed for us is part of our marketing strategy uh sure virginia says i should talk about feed <laughs> cows eat a lot and i know we already talked about at the beginning but Having your own supply of roughage, I feel, is very important uh, to be a successful, profitable small dairy. Oh, and they graze, which is awesome because they do all the work. And so just keeping, you know, what you're buying off the farm low, that obviously is going to let you have more profit. Did I skip it? I don't know. Virginia can edit this out. The battery's light's not flashing yet. So this is probably one of the most important quotes in 
this publication. And they put it in bold because they must have thought it's important too. One of the most important principles in guiding any farmer, especially a dairy farmer, is to sell as much produce as possible, to buy as few supplies, and hire as little help as absolutely necessary, consistent with good management. And that is one of the core things of our farm, is we do our work, so we provide the labor. We have the cows do as much work as we can by, you know, them harvesting their own food and, you know, spreading their, their own, own manure. manure except during the winter time. And then we are controlling how many things we're buying off the farm, and we're also controlling our milk price. Uh, it's an interesting publication. Uh, in general, I look through old extension publications all the time. I find them fascinating, and sometimes I actually find good information. A lot of these older extension publications are scaled more to the size of our farm uh, because the we have a pretty small dairy and you don't see that a lot in today's agriculture and so universities aren't focused on that but you go back to the 50s and 60s when you had a lot of small dairies and there's a lot of information like i said before you know buyer beware some of this information is not good but some of it if you do your homework and you glean out what you need you can find some useful bits and then if you're watching this video and you've got the dairy bug, either you've had experience with dairies in the past or you just know this is your passion and what you want to do, do it. You can do it. We did it. You know, other people that we know have done it and you can do it. And we need more small dairies for our communities and for, you know, better food for our families and our neighbors and to take better care of the land. Thanks for coming along with us as we discussed some considerations for starting a small dairy. Uh, we covered this in just a few minutes. We had years and years to plan our dairy and it takes time, but as Virginia said, it is possible and we want to see more small dairies out there. So uh, you leave us a comment if you have a question. You can also contact us through our website at clovermountaindairy.com. Otherwise, we will see you next time. Have a good night.